Hi, my name is uh, Eddie Viterbo, and I have the pleasure of chatting today to Didier Renard. Um, and Didier, I, I was really delighted to be invited to chat with you, among other things, because uh, having watched your video strikes me that, and having read your work, there are quite a few similarities and overlaps in our work. Both of us are interested in critical perspective to child rights, and um, I've also looked in, in my work, looked at how child rights operate as a form of control and violence. And in thinking about these issues, I'm interested, and maybe that's something we could touch on today, interested in how critical childhood studies can be married with critical legal theory and critical human rights scholarship, how that dialogue between these different bodies of knowledge can help us think critically about children's rights. So the title of our conversation today is Critical Approaches uh, to Children's Rights. And when we talk about critical approaches, that invites all sorts of questions. Um, for example, what do children's rights look like in specific contexts? Uh, what are the effects of children's rights? What are the driving forces behind them? Um, and I know these are questions uh, you've also touched on uh, in your own work. Um, and at the same time, critical approaches also involve questions that are more explicitly and narrowly normative, mm -hmm. um, especially the question of what rights should children have. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this normative element um, of critical approaches. In other words, I'd like to hear what you think about how normative questions can best be answered or at least addressed. Um, so maybe we can start with uh, something you, you spoke about, which is the importance of attending to personal meaning making, while at the same time understanding this personal meaning making within its broader context. So a question I'd like to hear your thoughts about is how, if at all, can the approach you, you're describing serve as a basis for normative claims about children's rights? In other words, what I'm asking is, if we follow the, the approach you're outlining, then what should be the political and legal and, and social status of children? Um, and if you have any thoughts about this, can you provide a concrete example in, in a specific context of what this might look like? Okay, yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie, and also uh, Nico for uh, organizing um, this dialogue on critical um, children's rights studies um, and um, that's already <laughs> a very challenging question and, and really uh, that tackles uh, several issues I think um, and I think there are several aspects um, in your question um, in terms of what maybe I start with that part what is some kind of the driving force behind my idea uh, of what this critical approach can be um, I think it all starts from experiences of injustice. Um, and that's a different starting point, I think, than, let's say, general uh, ideas of children's rights, which mostly start from the convention or uh, a legal framework uh, on children's rights. My starting point is an experience of injustice that is taking place in the life worlds of, of children, uh, of people uh, in general. So my, my stake is uh, from below. How does one experience its own situation from below from its concrete uh, life world? And there we know that different uh, experience, uh, rights are not respected, people experience, children experience that, uh, Human dignity is not respected. So for me, that's a starting point. Um, so that's that links what you were referring to uh, the the importance of uh, the personal meaning making because it is in this experience that people see that what is happening is not is not right, is not just, is not fair. There is something going on here that is not fair. And well, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm I'm a social worker. That's my background and. I often say, and it's a bit provocative, um, well, I don't need a convention on the rights of the child to know uh, what is unjust. Look at what is happening in reality. Look what is happening uh, in, in different contexts. So it starts from this personal meaning making that people have in their concrete context. For instance, well, the topic 
that I've been uh, working about the past years, poverty, needs of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, on the right to an adequate standard of living, to know what is an adequate standard of living. Uh, there are children, families living in poverty, not having enough money to eat, not having enough money to um, pay costs to go to school, not enough money to for having holidays and so on. You don't need Article 27 to to realize and, and to 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 know that um, that this experience uh, exists. So that's my starting point. About it, what is the driving force behind this critical perspective? Starting point from experiences of injustice that are taking place at a personal uh, level where people make meaning of um, their context. And then I observe, and, and here starts, I think, the critical aspect. Then I observe that, so we have this personal meaning making, and then you have the, let's say, the discourse, the, the, the whole narrative on children's rights. And there is some kind of a big gap uh, according what, to what is happening here and in reality and what um, the discourse on, on children's rights is is expressing. Um, and if I, because you were asking also an example, uh, I come back again to the, the example of, um, of poverty. What we see, at least in the Belgian case, European case, and it's not always the same, but very it's very much similar. When I look at the part of what is children's rights, the children's rights discourse on child poverty. Well, it starts with the idea of child poverty. It's an issue of children living in poverty. And it is about children living in poverty. Um, and the, the answer to that problem is often then, well, we have to support children in their situation. So we have to develop policies in uh, in school, in, in youth care, in leisure time, and so on, so that this poverty can be tackled. And I mentioned several domains, but all these domains, and it is typical uh, for this children's rights discourse, and also links with your work, I think it is, these are all domains typical for children, mostly exclusively for children, what is called the, the, the child moratorium, the, 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 the youth land, whatever you call it, but a, a typical institution, a field specifically uh, for children. And so what is happening here then in this concrete context of child poverty, we say, well, we have to combat it. Of course, we have to combat it, but we only focus on children. We only focus on um, those minors that are confronted with all these experience. That is mainly the children's rights discourse. Coming back to reality, then we see something completely different. Then we see children using a lot of strategies uh, in, in the micro situation, in their life worlds, in their personal uh, living environment, a lot of strategies where they know, well, I saw a lot of bills in the closet of my parents. I know they have a difficult month. It's not the time for me now to ask for new shoes. It's not the time for me now to ask for new clothes. They use a lot of strategies to deal with that situation because they often know what is going on. A lot of solidarity at a personal level between children and parents. Also, in the other way, parents use also a lot of strategies to deal with the situation. They say, well, I'm sick, but I will not go to the doctor so I can spare some money that I can give to my children. I um, don't have a lot of money to, to rent a house with two rooms, so I use just one room, I give it to my child, and I will sleep on the couch um, um, in, in, in another room. So also parents use other strategies. So what you see in reality, in, in the concrete life worlds, in the case of poverty, there is a lot of solidarity between children and parents. In the discourse, we talk about child poverty, and we are losing parents. And I think that is a problem from a critical perspective, I would say then there is a problem in our discourse on, on in the way we, we, we deal with children's rights in, in the case of poverty. There is really a problem that we talk about children only and we only focus on supporting children in these specific child domains because we are losing parents. And it's almost impossible to think that you can have a child living in poverty without a parent of the child living in poverty. They both live in poverty. So we have to link it somehow uh, with each other, with both these situations. And, and also in this discourse, and also children's rights is struggling with it, is that we look at children as what we call the, the deserving poor, in the sense that they deserve support because it's not their fault, it's not their responsibility that they live in poverty. But the parents, oh, 
they have not been doing enough to support their children to stay out of poverty. They have not been doing enough to have work, to have uh, a job, to have an income so they can support their children. So the parents are often considered as, well, the ones that are responsible for their own poverty situation and for the poverty situation of their children. So at the structural level, at the discourse and the way we look at children's rights, dealing with poverty with children, we have a very narrow uh, focus dealing on the situation which, with the child and losing out the situation of the parents, while reality is showing us very, very different uh, reality or a very different uh, perspective with a lot of solidarity between parents and children. And so that is coming back to your question, uh, can you link this, this personal meaning making with, with a broader context? And I think that is very important here um, that we link this daily lived realities of children with this idea of, 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 of children's rights. And then I have a lot of questions of talking about children living in poverty from the perspective of child poverty, as we do in the field of children's rights. We talk about child poverty. Maybe it's more about family poverty or just poverty of children and families. So, and okay, language is also making reality and I, want, I don't want to be too focused on, on the language itself, but it says something about what we are doing here with, with the discourse, with the way we talk and act in the framework of uh, children's rights. And, and I think there, the, the, this discourse and this personal meaning making that happening in reality is, is very much linked to each other. And the last thing I want to say about it, we have been doing, so I, I consider myself as a child uh, rights scholar then, and we wanted to, research the topic of child poverty and what we did is not doing research with children but with parents as some kind of a statement uh, we want to talk with parents about living in poverty with their children um, and so it's very important to to see these different perspectives um, because at a more structural and also more normative um, level uh, it has important implications when talking about child poverty and not about family poverty or poverty. I don't know, is that some kind of a beginning of an answer, Heidi, of your, of your question? That's very, very interesting, Didier. Thank you. I, I think there are many problems with the, the dominant child rights discourse. And if I understand you correctly, just to clarify some of what you were saying, I think you touched in your answer on three uh, problems, uh, which are interrelated, by the way. One is the decontextualizing effect of child rights. Another, which is closely related, is the individualizing effect. So the individual child, as opposed or, or disconnected from their social environment. And the third issue is adults, specifically in this context, parents and the way in which there's um, it implicitly or explicitly the dominant discourse of child rights legitimizes apathy towards adult poverty or just adult suffering uh, yeah. uh, generally. Just to follow up on that, let's, let's assume some of our viewers are advocates of child rights. So just to clarify to them or to convince them in the context of poverty, specifically that you, that you talk about and that you've written about, they might tell you, and maybe this is something you've heard before, they might argue that actually there's nothing in the CRC that requires these uh, problems or that uh, necessitates this problematic approach. They, they would say, for example, the CRC, among other things, uh, by the way, I will comment in, in parenthesis, part of both the power and the problem with the CRC is that it can be, it's really vague. It says com competing in very ambiguous things. But one of the things that the CRC, as you know, does say, it talks about the, it enshrines the family and parenthood at, as a social institution, while at the same time allowing the state to intervene as it wishes in the family context. So someone might tell you, a child rights advocate might tell you, what you're describing in poverty is not the result of the dominant discourse of child rights, it's this application of the CRC, or it's just someone not sufficiently following the spirit of the CRC because the CRC was never intended to um, allow for poverty at the family level. 
Um, so this is not my own argument, but I'm de being the devil's advocate here just to, to allow you to clarify your argument and, and maybe especially to those who are not uh, thinking along similar lines. Yeah, I think you are right. Um, and what I'm what I'm opposing here in, in this critical um, uh, analy analysis of, of child poverty is not the CRC in itself, because indeed you could say, well, CRC in one way or another is rather neutral, or I agree there are some ambiguities within the convention, but that is still, um, I think, quite minimal. The problem here is not what we can call it the law uh, in the books. The problem here is the law in action. What is the effect of the CRC? How is the CRC used? So those critics that would say, well, did you what you are saying? That's not in line with the CRC. Well, no, the CRC is, in this case, relatively neutral. But again, what I see happening by advocates of children's rights using the UN Convention that is something different because then indeed you get the law in action and the law in action operates in a certain social field, a political field, a historical field. And all these aspects have an impact on uh, how this discourse is made, how interventions are set up. Then the more neutral um, principles of the convention is surrounded by by, by, by by power, for instance, um, by, by interests of people, by interests of a group. And then indeed you see that there are children's rights advocates and in my opinion, at least based on the Flemish context, there is a quite dominant um, group or a quite dominant perspective, a dominant discourse, making often very um, exclusionary claims for children, ignoring or forgot, forgetting parents. And that is not in the CRC, that is how the CRC is used. And we talk here about poverty, I can make a similar Example, for instance, when we talk about um, um, issues as smacking uh, children, eh? when we talk about um, corporal punishment, corporal punishment is not even mentioned in the Convention on the Rights of the Child as such. You can make interpretation of the Convention, bringing it to corporal punishment or um, ending corporal punishment, but as such, it's not in the CRC. Um, but there is a broad coalition uh, making a claim to prohibit that um, and making uh, a claim for adopting a law that at the national level that, that prohibits that. And then again, I think there would be a broad consensus, I think, within the children's rights community and outside that, well, in, in child rearing, it's better not to use violence. I think there would be a broad consensus about that. You should better not use violence. That's not a good instrument to raise children. So there is something to say about ending corporal punishment and to have a law uh, that prohibits that. What is out of sight, and that's why I'm struggling also with a legal ban on corporal punishment, what is out of sight in this discussion is that law in action. Imagine that we would have such a law that prohibits corporal punishment. I would how that law is being used. Because we know that it's not by having a law that it will end. It still will happen that parents or other educators will smack children. And then is the question, what do we do? What do we do when that happens? And so the law is not neutral. The law in action is not neutral. It operates in a certain context. And it's a danger of how this convention, how laws are used in practice, the law in action. And that is my critique to, let's say, the children's rights uh, movements. They often um, make a discourse based on ideals, based on um, large principles, and not based on reality, not based on empirical knowledge, um, not based on yeah, how daily practice is... is, is yeah, is, 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 is shaped and in this daily practice very different things happen and and we should be aware that law law is not neutral I, I, I don't go that far to argue that law is an instrument of the oppressor to oppress some might argue that i will not say that but at least the law and you you used i, I think a very important word i think the law at least is ambiguous 
that's the least we can say. It's ambiguous. It's not 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 clear cut that when you have a law, it will all be solved. No, the law itself can also be problematic. It acts somehow, and one of the actions that it's generating is it is selective. The the way the law operates and the way the convention operates, it's selective. And then we have to think: okay, who is in and who is out? If we have this law, who will be object of the law? Probably children in vulnerable circumstances. They are in. Who is out? Other people may, who, who might also use um, corporal punishment, but they are not object of this law. So, and that is a very important um, issue for me to, to look at in my research in the prescription perspective who is in and who is out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, obviously, there's a lot we could uh, say more yeah. about this. <laughs> Uh, but I think naturally it leads me to something else um, uh, we could uh, uh, think about, which is this ambiguity and fluidity of the law. Because so far you've focused on, I think, the um, potentially problematic effects of uh, this ambiguity and fluidity. And I was wondering if you think the same fluidity can also be used by critics, by critical approaches, um be harnessed and used uh in to to think critically and to address critically uh issues of uh children's rights and if you think there is the potential of using that uh, fluidity and, and ambiguity what could that look like how could they be used yeah <laughs> Wow, uh, oh, yeah, that's that's very really difficult eh? because if you look from the lens indeed of, of ambiguity and, and, and I would embrace that lens uh, uh, to use in a critical perspective, well, then it's it's very um, difficult to say or what to do. And it, it's, it links also, well, one of the things um, I also mentioned uh, in my presentation, um was the um an essentialist view that we often have on on children's rights and and on childhood or on the child uh, we see children as a category marked by age for instance um uh, that kind of perspective on children on childhood on children's rights does not leave any room for ambiguity and we know what the problem is with that also based on the Flemish, the Belgium case, uh, but probably also recognizable for other countries, for instance, in the case of um, youth care, youth care for young people who have uh, problems in, 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 in education and child rearing, they can appeal to youth care and it's there for young people until the age of, age of 18. And we saw in Belgium very dramatic cases, but really dramatic cases of young people becoming 18, having to leave youth care, because that's a system of just till 18, uh, still in need of support. And so to give some kind of an answer to their needs, they need to shift um, sector, shift field of support from youth care to adult care, which is a different domain with different institutions, with different practitioners, different and so on and so on. And they often cannot find a way because between those two domains, between youth care and adult care, there is a big, big wall. And that wall is there because we use the idea of child and childhood as a very essentialist um, idea. And we had some cases where young people have to leave uh, youth care and could not find their way to adult care. And yeah, it ended very dramatically. And so my... My plea here would be indeed to, to embrace ambiguity, to base fluidity. And I will not say that, well, get away with, with, with youth care. I think that it's not realistic, but also it is not um, something that, that is in a normative sense, something that we, we should strive for. I think it's good that we have a youth care. I think it's good that a lot of money is going to youth care. We have professionals working there who have a specific training and so on. It's good that we have it. Just like it is good that we have adult care. The question is, how can we make sure that when a young people is turning 18 and have to leave a certain system because there is certain, well, 
legitimate uh, ID that at certain such a moment you have to leave that system and you have to go to another system. How can we make sure that this transition um, goes well? Maybe we can find models where professionals of this youth care can also be some kind of a, a bridge towards adult uh, institution uh, or where, where adult institution can already come in at 70, at the age of 17 and whatever, there are, there are possibilities, but then you use these systems in a, in a more yeah, fluid way. Um, you also think about borders between age in a more fluid way. And I think that's something we, we have to, yeah, we have to take care of uh, instead of being very essentialist, but you are 18, bye-bye, and, and um, it's up to you now. That's not how it works. And this is just an example from youth care. I think the same can be said more general in terms of citizenship. Also, their children cannot go to vote, uh, at least not in Belgium, before the age of 18. But that does not mean that, that young people, even children, are not taking up citizenship. On the contrary, a lot of these children are doing things in society that shows their citizenship in practice. It's an idea of citoyenneté par acte, uh, as, as it's called in French, because they do something that is very um, meaningful in society. They are citizens, and I think we should look at, at those practices, at those uh, realities, again, away from the more abstract ideals to the lived world where children, parents, educators enact children's rights in daily practice. And there is happening much more. And there you see indeed what you refer to, to, to this fluidity, to this ambiguity. We are dealing with that in everyday practice, but it's not translated somehow in this children's rights discourse. It's not translated in the in the reports and in the organizations working. It's like two different two different fields somehow. And and that's a strange observation, but I think it's there. And so how we can get out of that? Look at reality. Look at what is happening on in, in on the on the ground, let's say. Um, I think there is there is an uh, that's a way to go I think. Where what you're talking about so far touches on on the on the one hand it seems like the ideals or the abs the set of abstracts which are the dominant discourse of child rights are inherently ambiguous at the same time the lived reality of children is also potentially ambiguous just not in in ways that necessarily match each other the ambiguity of the ideals doesn't necessarily reflect the complexity and the messiness of the lived uh, uh, reality and the context of that lived reality. And also, if I can just briefly add to that, as you noted, the law doesn't always necessarily serve the interest of the oppressor, but there is a power imbalance in the sense that if there is ambiguity within the dominant discourse of child rights, it's not like the child has the same amount of power mm -hmm. as you know, a social worker or a judge or a physician necessarily. So that ambiguity, even if it can be used in different ways, it cannot be used by everyone to the same degree. So there is some uh, power relations element there that does inform the ability to kind of benefit from um, ch children's rights or not benefit from it. I just want to uh, briefly, in the time we have left, um, on something that you talked about. You, you talk now about um, the essentialist nature of childhood. And also you started our discussion by saying and, and reiterating that your starting point is not the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but rather social justice. And the, world, the word that recurs in both of these uh, um, statements is child. And it's a word that both of us have been using a lot today. Um, some critical thinkers are are questioning uh, the the whether we should continue using that word because of its essentializing nature, because it doesn't fully reflect the complexity of the lived reality of these people that we call children. It kind of puts them in a very narrow, specific box, and then their rights and their behavior and their life are supposed to be modeled by that concept, child. Um, and if we're talking about a normative aspect, it also dictates who they can be, what they can do. So it's a very broad question, but do you have any thoughts about 
maybe the, the pros and cons of using this word child when we are thinking from a critical perspective about children's rights? Yeah. Well, I've, I maybe that's important to say. So I said it already. My background is, is social work, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but that's one of the reasons why I might have maybe a different look than, than a legal scholar. A legal scholar is looking often at the law, um, while social workers traditionally look look more in what, what is happening maybe in concrete context and in terms of justice. Uh, well, it's interesting to see it. It's maybe also... Um, yeah. Well, then when you have to uh, relate it to certain thinkers or philosophers, it's a bit like John Rawls uh, versus Amartya Sen. It's John Rawls making some kind of an ideal uh, way of thinking about justice, while Amartya Sen is more focusing on, on, on a conservative way, uh, looking indeed in what is happening, while Rawls oh, is... It's this roles that is um, general principles, general ideas about what, what justice should be like. And so indeed, my starting point is um, concrete context, life roles of, of children. And then we see, to come back to your question, on, on more essentialist views on, on, on childhood and, and children and, and the way out. A lot of my work that I've been doing the past years is, is about this, this, this childhood moratorium and this... this um, this, this youth land. And I think the existence of that structure in society, a structure that brings together all these institutions that are mostly focused uh, on children, um, at least something that we have to recognize there, that the way these institutions for children, uh, how they work, again here, they work in a very ambiguous uh, way. And People like uh, Michael Sebastian Hoenig, for instance, um, he explained the working of this childhood um, uh, moratorium uh, as preparatory arenas that implement a principle of integration by means of separation. That's very interesting to think about. So we try to integrate young people in society and we do that by separating them in, in, in very um, exclusive domains uh, that we, we organize for them. And, so the childhood domain is, is full of ambiguities. And again, that's I think that's a good idea or a, a, a good result that these ambiguities are there, but we have to see them and we have to recognize them and we have to also, I think, embrace them. I think it's not a problem that such institutions exist as such. That is not a problem, I think. I think the problem lies not in the structures. The problem lies in the way people dealing with structures. It's about the acting of people, uh, social workers, legal scholars, whoever, how do you use these institutions in practice? Uh, and then also, again, uh, people informed or inspired by the framework of children's rights, they often use them in a very yeah, rigid, uh, very um, uh, strict uh, strict way. And I think, so the, 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 the solution for me, and maybe there I'm a bit... Um, uh, I don't know how, how how I would call it, but a bit um, uh, well, not radical, and maybe some people would say not radical enough, because I think in terms of radicality, I might be radical in the analysis I make, but not in the solutions I give. I think the solution for the problem of um, very fixed ideas of children and childhood is not getting away with the notion of childhood of children. I think that is not the way to go because it is there. It has a very large history um, and it has brought us a lot of good things. And we should see these good things and weigh them somehow in relation to more bad things that can be the effect of the existence of this structure. So for me, it's dealing with those two uh, elements, looking and embracing what is good and trying to change what is bad. And in terms of uh, children, I think it's good that there is some kind of a notion of childhood and children, because in one way or another, children have some particularities in terms of vulnerability, for instance, in terms of um, not having the power and so on and so on. So it's good that it is there, but if it's there, to uh, neglect some aspects of their daily life, then it becomes a problem. So the question for me is how we can embrace their particularity, 
without um, making it impossible for their being with their own particularities to um, also and open up uh, and to 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 be more uh, flexible in in terms of what is possible. It's not because. Uh, children under the age of 18 don't have a right to vote, that they cannot participate in society. On the contrary, so let's make that possible. Let's make them participate in society. It's not because uh, there is a system until 18 and afterwards it's another system that there is not, nothing possible to make this switch between those two. That's dealing with ambiguity. And, and, and I think that is for me the way to go in, in terms of children's rights and in terms of dealing with, with a certain discourse and a certain system not getting away and getting rid of that, that means uh, some kind of a rebellion um, that at least I think it's first not realistic and also not something that we, we should strive for in, in normative sense that would be good. I don't think it would be good. Uh, for me, the way to go and, and trying to find what our good actions is, how can we deal with it, with those existing structures and those existing discourse and, and try to also see um, what the negative effects are to deal with also the negative effects and slowly changing the discourse and slowly changing these systems. That would be, be my answer um, to your question. And I hope it is an answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Didier, for your very thoughtful uh, answers. And you've given us uh, a, lot, a lot of food for thought. Um, I think we'll conclude here. I'll just invite our viewers to, if you haven't done that already, read Didier's work uh, and uh, read the, there's a growing and very rich uh, scholarship generally on critical approaches to children's rights. So hopefully uh, these two videos for those unfamiliar with the, this body of knowledge can be a sort of introduction uh, into that uh, conversation. So thank you again, uh, Didier. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your provocative questions. Uh, it, it also makes me think and, and, and try to bring a step further my own thinking and my own work. So it was very interesting also for me. So thank you very much for, for, uh, for organizing this and for uh, all the issues that you, um, that you raised.